I've been thinking a lot about the idea of permanence recently. Things that last, that we can touch. Things that won't just disappear into the ether one day without explanation. So much of our modern life is intangible. Just digital files hosted on a server somewhere. Or the license to use a piece of software that, once upon a time, you could purchase on a physical disk. With the advent of streaming services, the death of stores like Blockbuster, and the increasing digitization of every aspect of 21st century society, it's becoming harder and harder to actually own things. And that's not to say streaming services are inherently bad or subscription models can't be beneficial in some ways. Just that our ability to know that things we love or are important to us are truly safe and permanent is slipping away. The perfect video store... Welcome to Blockbuster Video! ...is popping up all over the country. There's one near you. When I was a kid, my parents would take me to Blockbuster. There was something magical about being able to walk down physical aisles of movies, to pick things up, read about them, ask the clerk his opinion, and go home excited to watch whatever movie we picked. I get the same feeling with bookstores today. Being able to hold something in your hands will always feel more meaningful than endlessly scrolling on Netflix, especially if you have to make sure to scroll away before each one starts autoplaying. Netflix was groundbreaking when it came out. Access to thousands of movies for a reasonable price, right from your home. But as with just about everything, over time it became more important to maximize profits than to provide a useful service. You've probably noticed your Netflix subscription price increase significantly over the past few years, and seen fan-favorite movies and shows pulled from the platform often for no good reason. And now Netflix is launching a tier with ads, and streaming services are talking about joining forces to create mega-apps that definitely aren't just cable at a steeper rate. This is a process called enshittification, and it's happening all across the internet. But for most people, this stuff just doesn't really matter. It's way more convenient to pay for a couple streaming apps instead of finding a way to rent or buy each specific title you're interested in. And you know what? That's perfectly valid. For a lot of us, it's only when our Wi-Fi goes out at dinner time that suddenly we think, huh, maybe it's not such a good thing to be entirely reliant on services that require an internet connection. But beyond the occasional inconvenience aspect, we're moving towards a reality where we don't own anything. Movies, music, TV shows, software, everything we spend money on is just a license to use something, not to own it. Even when you can buy a digital copy of something, say a movie for example, if you read the fine print, odds are you don't actually own it. With companies striking and scrapping agreements all the time, there's no guarantee that their servers will host that content forever. And when that happens, it goes away, whether you bought it or not. If you own a physical copy of something, a book, a movie, a record, it's yours. No one can take it away because of some backroom business deal. All the stuff on Netflix, HBO, Spotify, Audible, all that can be taken away on a whim. But there's another aspect to owning physical copies of media. Remember Avatar? There was a whole debacle about the studio removing the weird hair sex scene that was in the theatrical version. It ended up being one of those Mandela Effect situations where some people were certain that they'd seen it, and other people swearing it was never there. To put the issue to rest, it was there, it just wasn't in the original theatrical cut. The studio had chopped it before release, and it only got added back in with the extended version that hit theaters a couple months later. I mention this because Avatar is one of the examples people like to point to when talking about censorship on streaming platforms. It wasn't really the case with that one, but there are plenty of examples where films and TV shows are being edited or removed entirely for censorship purposes. The French Connection is one such example. You can only find the censored version on American streaming apps. An episode of Spongebob got the same treatment. When you don't own a physical copy of the original, it makes it harder to see the artist's original intent. As a side note, this goes hand in hand with the sharp decline in media literacy among young Americans. By insisting all characters are unproblematic, you often miss the entire point of including those characters. Sokka from The Last Airbender is a prime example. He starts out as a misogynist dweeb and experiences tremendous personal growth over the course of the series. Anyway, owning physical media helps keep a record. It highlights the instances of censoring or altering media to fit an agenda, whether corporate or ideological. While sometimes it can be the correct decision to make insensitive content harder to accidentally stumble across, the arbitrary nature of some of these bans and edits shows just how fragile our access to art and culture can be. Censorship isn't new, but now we also have to contend with streaming services pulling or cancelling shows just to use them as a tax write-off. 
This is especially damaging in the case of content that hasn't gotten a physical release, like many Netflix original movies. When money is always the bottom line, these companies will often just pull the plug and let hundreds of people's work just fade away, making it all but impossible to find that content ever again. But setting aside movies and TV for a moment, people's livelihoods are also at risk thanks to this impermanence. A decade ago, you could go to Best Buy and buy a physical copy of Adobe Premiere, or After Effects, or any number of other pieces of software that we creative types rely on for our work. Fast forward to today, and I've paid god knows how many thousands of dollars to Adobe for the privilege of renting their buggy software through their Creative Cloud subscription model. Their customer service is already garbage. What happens when they just decide to pull the plug entirely? I don't own the software, but I'm completely reliant on it. Every Adobe user on the planet is held hostage by a company trying to maximize its profits. The videos I produce with the rented software live on another corporate platform with complete control over what gets monetized, what gets hidden or removed, and what you're allowed to say. When we engage with the digital world, we check certain privileges at the door. If YouTube ever chooses to delete my channel, or if the platform ever gets hacked, some of my content would be lost forever. I don't have backups of some of my older videos. They will become lost media like the movies and shows that Netflix and Disney and Paramount are scrapping for tax purposes. This is the case for literally millions of creators and hundreds of millions of videos from around the world over the last 15 years. When they're wiped from their current home online, wherever that is, for most of those videos, that's game over. There's a growing field of digital archivists working to catalog and preserve the trillions of gigs of data that are currently at risk of vanishing forever based on some arbitrary corporate decision or technical malfunction. This is a new problem, something we didn't have to worry about quite as much before the advent of the information age. Okay, we all know that a lot of corporate practices are gross, and that it can be inconvenient if Netflix rotates some of your favorite movies off the platform. But there's more to it than that. I want to get back to the idea of permanence. I can't pass down my Netflix account to my daughter. I mean, I could give her my email and password, but it's not something she would treasure after I'm gone. I've heard older people lament what they have to leave behind. A photo album, some journal entries, old Polaroids and movie stubs. A whole life fit into a shoebox. And you know the amazing part? Most of us today don't even have that shoebox. Our photos are all digital, tied to a username somewhere in the cloud, or on Google Drive just waiting for a critical system failure to wipe them away. Years of memories hinging on the goodwill and security of a multinational corporation. Our favorite music is just a Spotify playlist at best. Our favorite movies are becoming increasingly more difficult to track down as streaming services fight over rights or arbitrarily lock content in a vault. And this is stuff we don't even consider most of the time. We don't like to think about mortality, and that's understandable. But think about what your parents have kept from your childhood. If you're my age or older, they probably have hundreds of film negatives. That's a treasure. You could go and get those scanned and make prints for your wall, or a photo album. What do we have to leave our children? If we're not careful, the answer will be nothing. That's part of the reason I've been shooting a lot of film the last couple years. I enjoy the more physical process, but it also gives me negatives I can store for when Evie is older. Same goes for family video. A lot of photo albums have sleeves in the back for a disc. Burn your family videos onto a Blu-ray and keep them with the album. And this goes beyond photos and home movies. Buy physical copies of your favorite films. It supports the artists, and you get to watch them whenever you want, even when your internet is down. Read paper books. It's a completely different experience than a PDF on an iPad. Most albums are released on vinyl or CD these days. Get a copy when you really like the album. Many of my friends will play board games on Tabletop Simulator which is great for friends that are spread across the country, but it just doesn't compare to the tactile experience of physical pieces and being together with people you care about. Not to mention the whole internet dependency thing again. I'm a huge Magic the Gathering fan. I could play on any number of online services, but who knows how long those will be supported. I want to own my cards, be able to play at the kitchen table, let Evie look through my collection and learn to play with me. Paper books especially are a unique experience. Watching kids interact with them is amazing. Evie will rummage through her basket of books, look at the covers, pick one, flip through the pages, and be totally engaged. As soon as she sees a phone or an iPad, that spark is gone. The curiosity and cleverness is replaced with a blank expression and complete unresponsiveness. Now, I'm not trying to be an old curmudgeon and say it's those dang iPhones. Quite the contrary. My job is 100% reliant on the internet. But because of that, I've seen firsthand how important it is to separate ourselves from the digital world and engage with physical reality. 
Our greatest strength as a species is our ability to imagine bold new ideas and make them real. But that also comes with challenges. Children born today are on track to own nothing and not to realize that things used to be different. They're on track to be ever more captive to extractive subscription models seeking ever greater profits. And they're on track not to receive that precious shoebox from their parents. That's why permanence is so important. So go browse the Criterion Collection at Barnes & Noble. Watch the bonus features on that DVD. Read a physical book. Print some photos. Put on your favorite album. Know that no one can take that away from you. And maybe someday, that album will be a memory to be treasured long after you're gone.